So I just want to welcome, my, firstly, my name is Matt. Um, I'm a part of the Leo Panich School uh, Organizing Committee and a member of the Socialist Project. Um, we're hosting tonight's event, System Change, an eco-socialist discussion on environmental crisis. Here, uh, we wanted to thank Climate Justice Toronto for taking part in the event. Uh, two of the speakers tonight are from that great group, so we're thrilled to have them as a part of this, really doing this together with us. So I'd just like to make an acknowledgement. Uh, the Socialist Project and the Leo Panich School would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas with the credit. The land on which Toronto sits is still a home to many indigenous people. <laughs> Excuse me. While we must strive to do more than just acknowledge, we are grateful to have the chance to gather and hold this discussion in this place. We believe that it's important to recognize the common struggles experienced by both indigenous and non-indigenous working people and in the ways in which capitalism relies on prejudice, exploitation, and oppression to keep us divided. So I think we all should recognize that. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sharmini, who's going to lead us through some introductions and get into the panel itself. Following the panel will be a quick Q&A, so if anything pops up for you as people are speaking, you think of anything, hold on to that, and there's going to be a time for us to have a bit of a discussion afterwards, so thanks very much. Thank you. Charmini Pires. I'm a member of the Socialist Project. Um, I'm going to be a moderator for today and, uh, and also present uh, along with some of my colleagues uh, at the Socialist Project our collective position on eco-socialism. Uh, my day job, I'm a journalist, uh, editor, producer of news, um, news docs, and also children, I have five of them, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm quite invested in the future uh, of our planet um, and how we're going to live in it. So um, with that, I'm, I regret saying that uh, Tiffany Baldushki, um, who is the um, vice president um, of the QP, Ontario, uh, QP Ontario uh, who is supposed to be our big Bill, I don't for this evening in terms of somebody who's very engaged in the conversation um, and uh, in the union movement that we were expecting to hear from will not be with us today. Unfortunately, she has a personal matter with her uh, child and so um, very sad to say she won't be joining us, but do not fear, we have a very esteemed panel here. Um, and this evening I'm gonna start off with um, Winnie Collins, um, and uh, Winnie is a PhD student in polit uh, politics at York University, and, um, and uh, he is uh, doing research, um, and his own, uh, research focus, I should say, is, the, is on labor unions and organizing amidst this climate crisis and potentially um, uh, delivering climate action that materially improves the lives of uh, the members of the labor union, but also us, obviously. So, uh, Willie, I'm going to start with you. Okay, good. Uh, so I will try and speak slowly, but uh, when I get excited, nervous, and Scottish, uh, I <laughs> tend to run away, so slow me down. Uh, but yeah, it's great to be here, and thanks to all the organizers at FP for putting this event together, and for you folk for making it out. Uh, again, I know, uh, especially as Matt said, uh, with this being rearranged. Uh, so yeah, my name is Vinnie Collins. Uh, I'm originally from Scotland, but I've lived here in Toronto now for seven years. Uh, so I did my masters, and now doing my PhD at York University. Uh, so I'm just starting the fourth year of my PhD, and will be starting my field work in late fall. So I'm quite new to SP. Uh, I joined through the reading group on eco-socialism, uh, which I recommend for folks interested. Again, speak to folks at the table. And yeah, I'm happy to learn and, and work uh, with them. Uh, so I'm just going to get to talk uh, for uh, hopefully no more than 10 minutes about my research. Uh, so my research explores the potential of labor unions to be a key site of organizing the working class. 
in order to win the transformative climate action necessary for decarbonisation. So I believe that a strong labour movement is critical for a just energy transition and has to be a central component of an eco-socialist politics. In response to the major fault lines in the changing nature of work, labour unions are starting to engage in experimentation and a bit to dictate work with many unions involved with securing unionised jobs in the decarbonised sector through just transition policies, the development of political actions and collective bargaining strategies such as bargaining for the common good. Labour unions are finding ways to make successful interventions to shape the transition, but today the literature has failed to attend to how union-led organising can secure this strong climate action. So it's clear that capitalism that drives climate destruction needs to be dismantled. The labour movement must be part of this fight. Over the past century, labour unions have been crucial actors in the fight for justice. They've all, always fought for health and safety regulation, which arguably is climate action. This is the context in which the con concept of the just transition comes from out of the labour movement. And they've played roles in improving the material reality of workers in the broader communities, despite defeats uh, that they remain a key institution building worker power today. However, as we all know in this room, the labour movement today is far from where it needs to be. In re recent decades, many unions have fought climate provisions. Many are top down and maintain a business model. So to be clear, I do not believe labour is currently meeting the challenge of the climate crisis. Rather, I believe through the collective power of rank and file workers, democratic governance, and ultimately through their ability to force concessions from employers and government by withholding their labour, they have the potential to build the power required. So my research is a comparative analysis across three contexts, Ontario, Scotland, and New York, in which labour is, is at least engaged in attempts to shape a just energy transition. So the first case I look at, New York, will focus on the low labour coalition Climate Jobs New York. Climate Jobs New York stemmed from the Workers' Institute at Cornell University. They produced a report grounded in workers' experience and policy research. From this report and the coalition's ongoing work, Climate Jobs New York embarked on a proactive agenda that was focused on building up labour unions' power working to realise the opportunities from the transition to a decarbonised economy, and then organising and mobilising to secure these victories. The Labour Coalition secured a union jobs guarantee for an offshore wind project that, that will deliver half of New York's energy needs by 2035. So this approach is already gaining tra traction in other states in the US with the potential to act as a blueprint for securing climate action elsewhere around the world. So also in um, my look at New York, look at the more recent success of the Public Renewables Act, an effort to build public democratic ownership. In the next context I look at is Scotland, which is legislating one of the first just, just transition commissions in the world, and crucially with Labour at the table. Since its creation, both uh, commissions uh, sorry, both uh, commission reports have made several recommendations which the Scottish Government has promised to act on. However, deeper scr scrutiny of the just transition legislation and the Scottish Government more broadly tells more the story of workers uh, and labour being left behind. For example, a recent report revealed that the first show offshore wind auction in Scotland only generated a tenth of the jobs that the Government promised. The government's also faced criticism for creating a public energy company uh, and a public investment bank, only to let them fail by underfunding them. And when it had an opportunity, crucially, to take over what could have been a manufacturing hub for renewables with a factory that was building offshore wind turbines that went into liquidation, they reneged on this promise. And this manufacturing is today being done in Vietnam and Indonesia, where labour standards, work conditions and wages are low and corporations are profiting off the back of the exploitation of workers. This was despite a concerted campaign by trade unions across Scotland. The last case I look at is here in Ontario and as we all know the outlook is not great. 
There are glimmers of hope, but his unfortunately more the sto story of a failure to act. The pr promise of Green Jobs Oshawa, as uh, Tiffany Balducci was going to speak to, uh, was one of the cases I actually explored in my masters and have gone back to, and it's like many disappointed. Uh, today's context kind of highlights, again, why they were kind of right. You have government subsidising corporations and EV manufacturing, which it exposes this trajectory of green capitalism, which were in where profits flow to a few very rich shareholders, that in, rather than under what Green Jobs Oshawa proposed, which was public democratic ownership, where the profits could be invested in communities and workers. The UAW and the states in Unifor here are bargaining at the moment with the big free car manufacturers with a strike woman. In the US, we've seen leadership at UAW call for a just transition to EVs with calls for substantial wage increases, a 32 hour work week and calls to ensure EV plants are using unionized labor. However, there's little talk of public democratic ownership. So I'll finish off uh, with some initial findings, thoughts. Uh, so by comparing Scotland to a similar auction in New York, uh, you can see the impact of climate jobs New York, that of a proactive labor union coalition. So one project delivered a prevailing wage, unionized jobs, apprenticeships that will build the unionized workforce of the future, and the others has failed workers, and as of today, there is still no collective agreement in place for offshore workers in Scotland. However, there are some promising signs at a grassroots level in Scotland. A report on offshore workers in the oil and gas sector has workers calling for public democratic ownership and calls for transitioning their jobs from the oil and gas sector to offshore wind. These workers are unionised, however, the question of resources comes up, particularly with the UK in the midst of strike action not seen in a generation. And the saga over the manufacturing plant I discussed earlier highlights the importance of manufacturing to a just transition. This is where a majority of jobs will be in renewables. This highlights the need to ensure these jobs are unionised and do not follow the green capitalist trajectory of the precarious and low pay work. It also highlights the need again for public democratic ownership. The race to the bottom in terms of wages, which we see with the offshoring of jobs, labour standards and regulations, uh, thanks to global north governments and corporations, has to be reversed. Provisions to bring manufacturing of renewables must go hand in hand with support for global south countries who have been plundered on behalf of capitalism. There have been calls for climate reparations cancellation of the debt, which trade unions should support. Trade unions for energy de democracy have supported public ownership bids in countries in Africa, and international trade unions have, had, uh, have done some work on this, but much more needs to be done in order to build a kind of internationalist working class. And in terms of what we call eco-socialist policies, in New York, DSA organized and won the Bill Public Renewables Act, which will move the power grid in New York onto renewables by 2030. And importantly, it will create tens of thousands of green union jobs thanks to ironclad prevailing wage requirements, project labor agreements, and Buy American provisions. It will also bring back public ownership through the New York Power Authority, the US's largest public utility to plan build and operate renewable energy projects. So although some units were not on board uh, to begin with, I think it again highlights this kind of crux there in the importance of public democratic ownership and why this needs to be uh, an important part of a just energy transition. Also what will come out of the UEW strike could well, or looming strike, could well be consequential Wins like these can raise the standards of what can be achieved and hopefully they're successful in their, in their demands. So I'll just finish off with the hope of the research that I'm doing is that the focus will again be directed towards labour unions, their role in fighting for justice for workers and their communities and the implication this collectivisation could have for the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, next, we have Nicholas Agrawal. Nicholas is a climate justice and labor organizer. And in 2019, he helped co-found Climate Justice Toronto. And in 2021, became a member of People's Labor Project, which I'm sure he'll tell us about. And he's interested in building a working class power to confront capitalism and climate change. So again, in terms of our missions, you know, we are converging here as well. So, Nicholas, you're on. Um, yeah, it's been such an interesting conversation so far. Um, I'll say never get in between any cats in an action item. Uh, <laughs> he'll keep you organized. Um, yeah, I would, I would love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts later on the DSA's recent win in New York because I think that uh, to me is really interesting. I mean, there was an excellent article um, uh, in this Times that just came out, I think a few weeks ago, that uh, profile that campaign. Um, and yeah, my, my, my co-panelists have excellent pieces of notes. I kind of wrote like half a page on a notebook when I got here, so um, my thoughts might be a little bit uh, less coherent, but I'm gonna try my best. Um, and I think that today I'll kind of be maybe um, kind of going through my own kind of uh, story of how I got to kind of where I am today, and kind of um, parallel that to kind of like where I see the climate movement kind of having come and, and uh, its direction as well. I think I, I feel very much like I've got, I've like tried every tactic under the book and I've like been through many different ideology changes in my life uh, to kind of where, where I am today. Um, just out of curiosity, like how many people here would kind of like identify themselves as like part of like the climate movement? Like as a kind of centering themselves in that. Okay, so I feel like a, a big group of people here, probably the other, other folks are like, you're just, I'm a socialist. So I think we're in, in good company. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that it's important to kind of think about kind of like where the movement uh, has come from and where it's going to really talk about um, kind of where, uh, how we kind of build, build it because I think a lot of people uh, obviously are, are, are unorganized in our different stages of kind of a, a trajectory that I think is really uh, common. And so um, I think it's just important to always kind of think about, think about that story. So. You know, like many people, like uh, many young people, I, I, I've been kind of part of two waves of the cli climate movement, something that I would maybe say from like 2008 to 2016, like the kind of like anti-Harper uh, kind of activism that was going on as well as kind of the, um, the like 350, the, the march for people, jobs, and climate that happened in 2016. Um, and then kind of as well, the kind of like last big upswing in social movement organizing, which uh, happened uh, 2018 to I'd say 2020 really. Um, and I think that, you know, my, my journey started with, as, a young, as a young child, kind of learning about climate change for the first time, being, being very uh, impacted and scared by the kind of prophets of the, of the future that uh, was, was coming up ahead of, ahead of me and feeling very kind of, um, uh, a really kind of like ge generational crisis that I think um, I no longer really uh, agree with that, but kind of like that really polarization of like, you know, your genera this generation let us down and it's up to us to really stand up and we're gonna change things and we're gonna be, you know, the ones that really get it right this time. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of that or initial organizing was really focused on, um, you know, the uh, Kyoto Protocol and then the Copenhagen, um, I don't know the names anymore, but the, 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 big, the big UN, um, accords, um, and then obviously the Paris Accord as well, uh, and a, a really kind of like a non, like very loosely anti-capitalist kind of framework. I remember thinking to myself in 2012, I was 17, I will admit then, but I remember going to a mass convergence of activists at the time and being like, I don't, I don't understand why I have to be an uh, anti-capitalist to be a climate change activist, like I, I, don't, I don't really get it. Um, and, and so, um, I think the climate movement really was just kind of this like movement of movements kind of coming together, uh, uh, people kind of caring about nature and caring about other, these other things as well. Um, I, I would say that there were definitely were kind of like, I think big, big, I think, um, narrative wins from, the, from that time. I think normalizing the fact that there was a crisis. I think for me, it's when I first got introduced to issues around indigenous sovereignty and kind of, um, the history of indigenous subjugation in, 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 in North America, uh, but by in large part, I think a, a failure to really confront the climate crisis. Um, and then 
I think the next kind of wage of uh, next kind of uh, wave of organizing for me really was the 2018 kind of like upsurge. I remember at the time um, the climate movement had really been focused on. Uh, I was based out west at the time, and it was really focused on uh, canceling the Kingdom Morgan pipeline, Trans Mountain pipeline. Uh, really focused on a, a series of tactics that had been winning for a while, right? Uh, 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 no Dapple, all these different kind of uh, Northern Gateway was cancelled. Uh, it seemed like there was something kind of, there was a tactic that was winning, uh, but Justin Trudeau seemed to kind of really throw all that under, under uh, throw, the, throw the broad left coalition uh, for that kind of like in disarray and had like uh, a government that actually fought a pipeline um, uh, against kind of uh, all kind of common sense of what was politically possible um, at the time. And so, for me, for me, I think that was really kind of a, a, a starting point, I guess a restarting point for me uh, that got me really uh, invested into, into organizing. Um, and uh, I think really watching as well the Sunrise Movement uh, in the US uh, and uh, you know, 20 young people sitting down in Senator Nancy Pelosi's office uh, demanding a Green New Deal and kind of uh, that just kind of capturing um, the media cycle and the climate movement in a storm. Um, uh, and uh, at the same time, I'm wearing the t-shirt, uh, a group of young people convened in Ottawa in 2019 for a gathering called Power Shift Young and Rising that really was trying to re-engage the climate movement um, and really was taking this idea of the Green New Deal, this idea that there's that state intervention is needed on the climate crisis um, to, to the mainstream and to really build the movement out that way. But at, again, at the same time, I think a lot of the failures that Anika was mentioning was that that was not an ideological, <laughs> ideologically based uh, movement, uh, really focused on kind of, again, being like kind of, you know, in solidarity with different movements, you know, migrant rights, indigenous rights, things that are really important, but not really naming uh, capitalism and class as something that's really important for us to organize around. Uh, and then we see that, um, you know, as that movement evolved, uh, it just kind of really just like went in every different direction and kind of really uh, become, became un, unfocused because in my opinion there wasn't really a class uh, focus um, in, that, in that organizing. And um, I think, and, but you know, so Climate Justice Toronto started at, started at that time and uh, we were really kind of caught up, caught up in the moment, momentum. Uh, it was my first foray in federal election politics. I thought, you know, this. This is gonna be it. This is gonna be the year that we're gonna do this. Like we're just gonna get the NDP elected. We're gonna get all these MPs across Canada in. We'll have you know enough power in Parliament, uh, and we're gonna win. And it, it really felt at the time the kind of milieu that like that actually felt possible and it felt exciting. It what it's what drove me to give so much of my life uh, in that time and really burnt myself out kind of doing that organizing. Um, and I think then the failures to actually see any gains on that really kind of made me go into a, a reflection mode. And it wasn't, it wasn't really until the pandemic that um, I think like all, most organizing stopped for the most part that there was actually time to think about theory. You know, I think there's always this kind of like debate on the, on the young left, I should say, uh, like, you know, read theory. And then other people are like, I don't have time to read theory. And then <laughs> kind of debating that. And, and there was a global shutdown that really allowed me to kind of start reading some theory. Um, and um, yeah, I think just kind of being introduced to the idea that, uh, you know, like uh, to seize the state requires working class power and we're gonna need the state to confront the climate crisis. Uh, and actually what are the institutions of, what are the, how do we actually do that? Um, and uh, I, I think a big lesson for me that kind of uh, showed it that it was mass organization uh, that was disciplined and membership based was actually trying to uh, intervene intervene in the 2021 uh, federal NDP election, uh, federal NDP convention. I don't know if anyone has had the misfortune of <laughs> trying to do that before or being at an uh, NDP convention. Uh, it's quite a hopeless space, really depressing. Um, and um, I think, yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, Raiden was there with, with us. And uh, I remember at the time, so we, we were trying to pass, there was a resolution calling for a very modest, I think, just transition type of language. Uh, we tried to kind of sneak an amendment in there that would booster, uh, uh, booster that. 
as well as add kind of uh, contingencies around unionized labor and other kind of things that we saw as the solution. Uh, and it, it made it to the, to the floor, which was really surprising. We got really excited. And then uh, the, all the party apparatus came against it. And it was, really was uh, representatives from the labor bureaucracy that really shut down our motion to build the labor movement, actually. Um, it was a lot of people from, it was uh, representative, representatives from uh, the steelworkers, the EFCW, and the CLC. Uh, uh, I really believe in labor, so it's not really, um, I'm not, not, not speaking out against them, but just that, that kind of, um, it just really highlighted to me that there was so much organizing that had to be done amongst the bottom, that these ideas to kind of change change who was in power or to change like this, the, we were not, we not going to win any substantial policy change by trying to pass something at a convention or pass something at that if there wasn't a huge rank and file and organized movement behind us. And so CJTO has kind of, I think, I, I've taken that lesson to a lot of kind of the organizing that we've done in CJTO. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it, it, it took me a long time to realize that the organizing tradition amongst the left was actually really an anarchist-based tradition that kind of I think came, comes out of the reaction to dictatorships and the USSR, uh, which was not something that anyone had ever told me. You know, we do horizontal structures and we do non-leadership decision making and we do uh, all these things that, in my opinion, really keep us weak. Um, but no one had ever told me that that was actually based in, in, in ideology. In ideology, so. Um, for me to learn kind of like more about socialism and communism and to learn about kind of like how actually history has, has won things and how actually organization is, is, is an important part of that. And so now we have CJTO in 2023, we still definitely have a lot to grow and a lot to learn. Uh, we're really kind of focused on building uh, power through winning material gains amongst the working class that also affect the climate crisis. So we kind of are focused right now on stuff around housing. You know, housing and transportation are the two biggest sources of emissions in the GTA, uh, as well as probably the two main issues in affecting people in the cost of living, living crisis. The uh, rent is too high, people have a hard time getting around, transit is expensive. Um, uh, and so we're kind of really organizing along uh, those those things right now, um, as well as uh, focusing also on the la on labor organizing, building. Uh, we know we know we need uh, more people in unions, uh, and we need a period to, to kind of win, win win gains for the working class. We also know that that unions need to change, and that there are more socialists and more uh, uh, communists that enter the labor movement and can struggle in, as a site of terrain for that. Um, we'll hopefully also challenge those institutions and, and get them to really be. Powerful, powerful uh, weapons against uh, the capitalist elite and actually allow us to confront the climate crisis. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, let me start off by uh, saying a few things about something we've been doing at the Socialist Project, which is having regular conversations about uh, eco socialism. Um, one has been among sort of a uh, smaller group that's been developing a statement uh, that we could share with you and we are hoping to add to it uh, from your experiences. And uh, secondly, you may all have also come uh, to know that we've been organizing a eco-socialism uh, discussion group where we're actually doing readings and having uh, deep dives into people uh, from Marxist as well as uh, socialist um, academics who have been writing about this and, and uh, trying to discuss and understand better uh, what they have written um, over the last uh, while on this issue. And that is being organized by Tori in the red shirt back there. <laughs> so if you're interested in joining that group, uh, please. Um, ask her how you may do that. Um, okay, so let me um, start off with a couple of points, and I think I'm going to have to um, rely, because we as a group have been discussing this issue for a while now, um, some of the people actually sitting in the audience um, uh, are quite versed in this topic, more so than I am, and so I'm going to call on them from time to time to elaborate on some of the points we want to make. 
Um, so um, first, I, I want to start off by contextualizing the uh, issue we are discussing today um, in a more broader sense, in the, in the sense that you know, we are aware of the uh, fact that we as a country, Canada as a country, um, is clearly a petro-state. Um, and what we have been uh, hearing today on this panel is organizers and labor unions and efforts like um, divestment campaigns and so on. We've made some you know, small gains in terms of stopping the pipelines, making interventions in the political parties and so on, but it's having very little traction. And, uh, and what, one of the things I, I want to say about that is um, I think that kind of sentiment is felt around the world. Um, in the small little island country that I come from in Sri Lanka, who is experiencing a huge debt crisis at the moment. Um, can you hear me? Um, and debt crisis at the moment is also experiencing a terrible ecological crisis as people are getting more and more desperate and moving into the into the jungle and habitats for growing food, habitat of uh, you know, the environment uh, that is a jungle, basically a rainforest. Um, I don't know if some of you saw, but uh, recently there's been incredible events where elephants um, uh, and humans have been killing each other uh, because humans are moving into their uh, uh, habitat and, uh, and humans have no place to go but into the Anna, you know, land that's available for them to grow their food. Uh, particularly under their uh, under this economic crisis, and this kind of uh, th just to give you how bad it is in the last couple of years, um, each year over 400 elephants have been killed by humans, and about 2,000 humans have been killed by elephants. You know, the, it's it's come to such a uh, desperate situation in a very small country where there's 4,000 elephants and uh, at a rate of uh, you know killing 400 of them annually uh, there isn't going to be much uh, of m m many more elephants left in the country in a few years so uh, that's one situation today I was able to also um, uh, listen to this big report that had come out uh, from the World Bank and the IMF, uh, a country report on Brazil, um, where I learned this report was written by Brazilians, um, uh, and actually the World Bank kind of distanced themselves from it at the end of the report uh, presentation, but what they have discovered is that the Amazon uh, is actually, at this time, uh, emitting as much CO2 as it is dealing with in terms of the forest, um, you know, absorbing CO2 and emitting it, and it's it's now equalized. Um, so you see the devastation in what has been going on in uh, the Amazon in terms of illegal mining, um, mining for diamonds and minerals, and uh, and the deforestation that's going on in terms of the. Um, you know, trees being cut down at a rate, uh, incredible rate that has been, you know, more and more authorized both by the Tamar and the uh, and the uh, Bosnia governments. Um, in the last uh, seven years that they've been in power, there's been so much uh, uh, damage done uh, that they're actually thinking it is not recoverable. Um, and the other thing. Uh, that we must uh, keep in mind is also Brazil as a state, uh, you know, is uh, not only mining their own country uh, for energy and resources that they're exporting, as well as for their own use, but they're also all over the world, you know, and just here in Canada, yeah, we have our um, uh, nickel mine in Sudbury that is uh, a, a ballet, Brazilian um, company. 
that is uh, mining, and you probably heard about the devastations it's caused and the job, uh, you know, the uh, labor unions, the struggles that they've been experiencing there. So a state like Brazil, um, you know, which uh, people kind of feel warm and cozy because they have the lungs of the world in the Amazon, it's getting devastated at a rate that we cannot even uh, begin to imagine. But having <laughs> put that in context, let me actually um, go into some of the points that we want to make. One is that we want to start off by defining uh, what eco-socialism is. Um, and one academic, John Bellamy Foster, um, who is the editor of the Monthly Review, says that eco-socialism is demanding a whole new stage of ecological civilization for humankind. Uh, based on the creation of a society that substantively um, equal and ecologically sustainable. Now, he later says that this will, of course, mean a revolutionary transformation in social relations governing production, consumption, and distribution. This means that dramatic shift away from the system of monopoly capital, exploitation, exploration, waste, and the endless drive to accumulate, you know, transforming our world seems like a huge task, which we, you know, we heard from the panel today, which is run, we are running into um, um, more and more resistance to that. Um, uh, I know that uh, Nicholas uh, made the statement where, you know, he, uh, we in Canada don't have, you know, a Green New Deal like they do in the U.S. And that state intervention is very important, but we can also, I think, acknowledge to a great degree in the sense that um, the way the state behaves is actually protecting, and sometimes they're the problem, and we are not really sure that uh, the intervention in the form that it exists now um, is in the interest of this transformation that we, as social movements and ecological movements may require. Um, so the other is that the um, in this era of uh, neoliberal globalization, capital remains free to move when and where costs are the lowest and profits are the highest, um, forcing workers to work harder and for less money, for competing with other workers in different parts of our own country, as well as in other continents and countries around the world. Now, uh, the other big issue that many people have uh, uh, raised ar around um, the ecological crisis is the, is the question of growth or degrowth. And uh, I bet many of you have come into uh, contact with that issue. Can we actually preserve the environment um, and address the ecological crisis while we grow as an economy? And this is, of course, always mostly being uh, growth in the interest of capital. Um, so the capitalist system seems to pair the ecological crisis with massive inequality with the former reinforcing the latter. These effects of the environmental crisis uh, land on working class people, indigenous people, and people with different uh, uh, access to resources. Um, and, and of course, the rich has ways in which they can escape, escape to space, escape to uh, underground shelters, uh, or even uh, you know, flying away when there's floods and so on, which is what was happening in Brazil not too long ago. But um, the growth and degrowth debate is something that I think we need to uh, discuss more. Um, I'm wondering, um, can I call on you, uh, Herman, to expand on that? Mm -hmm. We're not going to throw the mics. No, I think the key, the key thing for us in the Socialist Project is, uh, and I think it's not that different from what you folks have been saying, is that there's two levels. One is, we know that, that the, the, the climate crisis can't be addressed with the capitalists. However, we're, we're not going to get rid of capitalism tomorrow. The question is, how do we build for transforming, getting rid of capitalism, on the one hand, and two, how do we fight for reforms, like 
to challenge the, 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 the climate crisis at the same time. And uh, the two are, are, in terms of time, are, are different, but that's what we have to build for. And it's very interesting that our the folks from uh, Climate Justice Toronto talked about, well, you know, how do you build in the working class? Because uh, obviously we know uh, that it's, it, building a base in the working class is a critical component we have to have in terms of winning over working people, because we know why. Not just because the working class is, um, has potential to stop things, but it's the only class which potentially has a has a potential to uh, um, lead a struggle to get rid of capitalism. Um, but we all know that working people aren't there. The working class is separate, uh, is separated from itself. The stratum of it are divided. And so the question we have to sort of ask ourselves is: How do we start building in the working class? And how do we build the socialists? and is eco-socialist, because we can't separate those, those things off. And it's quite interesting to mention. Um, just for a second, uh, one of the things that Tiffany was going to talk about, and Vinny mentioned, was this um, uh, Green Jobs Asha. Was, and th they were going to close this map, this plant, which had, used to have like 14,000, Sam, was it 14,000 members at one time? And it was down to like uh, 3,000, and, and they, were, they announced they were going to close it. And so um, working with uh, some retirees and some, some workers there, we, 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 we discuss the possibility of doing something different, of having it become uh, not run by General Motors, becoming taken over by the state in some way. Uh, secondly, that, that it produce not uh, commercially based uh, private individual um, uh, transportation, which of course we know that the auto unions are pushing right now. Um, and <clears throat> and uh, uh, three, that, uh, that, that the working class people that were involved would be part of it. It didn't work. However, it was an experiment. And there have been experiments around the world with this which haven't necessarily come to fruition, like the famous Lucas uh, experiment in, uh, during, the, uh, during the 1980s, uh, 1970s in London, um, where workers there, who uh, uh, skilled trade workers who knew how the place worked, talked about producing something other than arms and, and that sort of thing. And um, we, we didn't succeed. And one of the reasons we didn't succeed was because most of the workers sort of either gave up or sort of had this idea that, well, you know, because the union was pushing this, that we'll convince GM to, to, to do some investment here. And the idea of breaking with their dependence upon this corporation is something that it's hard for workers to get. And why should they? Because they don't see any alternative. Which takes me to the, we didn't succeed because partly, and they, they, they ended up getting some investment there. And that ended that piece. But one of the things we learned, and I, this is what, what Tiffany was going to talk about, was um, that it's the law. It's it's not something you can just do overnight. That as as Anakin was talking, you got to be involved in in where in the working class institutions that people are at, and you got to be able to talk to people on a regular basis and do education with them. But you also have to be able to to um, to, to to make this bigger than just talking in one particular. Um, and uh, and one of the things that, you know, like I was going to say, but I'm not going to take this, why the working class is it's critical. If we're not able to win over working people around this, it's the cynicism of the right, you know, like you heard about Paul Evra at the, uh, you know, at the conservative convention, and there's Trump in the United States, that workers would say, well, I, I can't trust any of these institutions. The hell with this. We have to be able to, to be able to do this, but we can't just do it. Part of the problem is we can't just do it as individuals. We have to have organizations to do it. And as Annika was saying, a hundred years ago, there were other organizations. Yeah, there were socialist parties. Um, and I don't mean the NDP, because the NDP will never transform capitalism. It's not part of the whole social democratic movement, which organized for major reforms uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, um, is no longer able to do that, because the structure of capital is different. And in order to make those even modest reforms, the kind that we want, limit fossil fuels and a whole series of things, um, require more radical sessions. So I think for us, the critical piece is how do we build a, 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 new, a new stage of socialist organization, uh, and from the parties, um, to be able to go into these workplaces and communities, because the struggle, and not just the question of supporting the struggles are important, but developing relationships with working class people and having people like go into workplaces and you know not just factories but all kinds of places where people are and uh, develop socialists 
um, and but not just ordinary social, but eco-socialists, because it isn't just a question of uh, you know um, wildfires in the north and that sort of stuff. It has to do with their kids, their future, and you know if the auto workers think that in being able to get jobs and uh, and building uh, electric cars is going to solve that problem, they're themselves. What about public transit and moving away from dependence upon the private um, uh, transforma uh, transportation? Um, addressing the environmental crises uh, requires uh, two main elements, which is challenging capitalism and the power of capital and transforming the state based on a working class led capital movement, cap political movement, sorry, not capital movement, political movement. Uh, and secondly, that the, um, in the meantime, we really have to find ways to um, reform and re uh, eliminate fossil fuel um, from our daily lives. And that may need some immediate measures that we could act on. But one of the uh, sort of consensus uh, that has been building on this panel, I think, from all of our perspective, is you know although we've been working in different ways in different uh, places, unions and and the uh, social justice movements and so on, is that we're having difficulty with this movement really having traction as. Had put it so well. Um, having traction, you know, there are moments, there are you know really exciting opportunities and some successes, but but we are having trouble keeping a sustained traction, particularly in the working class. And why is this? You know, that's a, it, it's um, something I think we really need to address as a group. So as part of kind of like my other part of my life is that I was recently uh, part of 33 workers um, laid off from an arts nonprofit in Toronto um, and had been involved in uh, a, a, almost a two year uni, union drive there. Uh, and um, as well as kind of wearing a seat, uh, climate justice Toronto hat as well as also part of this organization called the People's Labour Project which helps to uh, which is modeled off EWOC in the US, the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, which is uh, basically seeks to like, help uh, workers in Canada get organized uh, into unions or start their own unions themselves as well. Uh, and so I was part of this drive for two years, and I think we talked about kind of the, the, the how uh, workers are so kind of far from where, from a lot of workers are very far from socialism, or very far from, you know, willing, to, ready to like pick up the mantle for these causes, but I would say also it's part of my greatest inspiration, I think, is just, was just talking to my colleagues about issues at work and kind of seeing people throughout the campaign really move from being uh, apathetic, didn't believe in their own power, didn't really believe that anything was possible, to actually believing that they could win and actually believing that it was possible. You know, we, we all were laid off and we actually have a meeting this week with the, with the mayor and, and a, a meeting with uh, leaders in the city government to kind of demand our owed, our owed severance and our owed um, uh, wages and kind of the future of our organization. So uh, I know, yeah, it, it's like I think when it's when it becomes so hard to think about this like mass, you know, the working class as a mass and you know with the ten year timeline and, and these really big things, just to really con conceptualize it that no, it's my coworker, this coworker I know, and that coworker I know, you know. I brought my coworker, who's a custodian, who has never been involved in law organizing before. I brought her to the picket line when the um, education workers were on strike uh, in the fall, and she told me it was the most inspiring thing she's ever been to. Right, and I think I think just those those things are the kind of seeds that start kind of this long long term project that we are building. Because like 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 you said, like the the build back the build the, the campaign in New York, they started in 2017, and they didn't wait until this year. So. Uh, the, the, a lot of these fights take a long time, and I know it's kind of we're in this competing crisis of the of this tipping point, as as was mentioned. Um, I just don't think we can let that stop us from really doing the day to day organizing work that we know works and is like time and time again uh, is effective. It just it just takes a lot of people doing it and, and doing it very often. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is to the um, point about the indigenous solidarity of sovereignty. I think that's 
uh, a very a really real point that I think that I'm personally still thinking through in the, in the concepts of kind of our, our, our organization. Uh, I entered radical politics through the through indigenous sovereignty movements, uh, through through I don't I don't know more and learning about um, uh, 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 that organizing uh, uh, 1492 land back lane. A big part of our CGTO's organizing was against um, a coastal gas lane pipeline, where and we were part of this national coalition, informal, very informal. I wouldn't say call it called coalition, just independent groups operating at the same time. Of, of, in the shutdown of Canada movements, and we uh, occupied Mr. Keelan's office, and we're part of different rail, rail, rail blockades that, in my life, it was the only thing that I've, I've ever seen substantially uh, 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 shape the Canadian economy was when uh, you know the, the rail lines and the ports in BC were, were, were blockaded. Um, but how do we actually make those movements tenable in, like, not, in the long term and not, not burn out um, a lot of the a lot of the people there that I was organizing with, um, uh, you know, when when there wasn't something right in front of them, kind of went on to mutual aid work and went on to doing other things that I, uh, that uh, are is important to me uh, is important, but I think isn't necessarily aligned with the vision of like a long term revolutionary, revolutionary mo uh, movement. And so I, I think I'm, I'm thinking through that still as well. And uh, I definitely hear your point and I echo with it that uh, the indigenous. Uh, sovereignty movement in Canada is like a really radical and really militant um, revolutionary force um, uh, to actually challenge, you know, uh, land land ownership and capital accumulation uh, in this country. So yeah, thank you also for that comment. Thank you. going <laughs> and we have such a great menu of um, topics to discuss and uh, we've opened up a, a lot of questions we haven't really come to you know conclusions except to say that you know we need to do more organizing we need to do more in practice of the labor unions we need to you know organize better and more effectively but of course how to have greater impact is the biggest question on, on the floor. Um, so uh, I hate wrapping this up, but we are moving into a social, uh, and maybe these conversations um, we have raised this evening can be taken up in that context. Uh, well, I might just wrap this up, okay. if that's okay. But uh, first, everyone, can we have a hand, a round of applause for the panelists? And <laughs> And for Charmini, our moderator as well. Please.